All right. Thank you. And now we'll start with our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, kindle them the fire of thy love, send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful, Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit to have right judgment in all things and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. And in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Can everybody see that all right? Is it centered well enough? Is this, all, you know, it seems to me this would even be better than trying to go out there. I don't think we're going to have any more than this room can hold, and I can certainly double up the chair. So maybe we'll, last year. yeah, we were here all last year, but this year I wasn't sure how many people would come, and, and that would save um, them a lot of taking things down. Hey, there he is. Come on in. We haven't even started yet. We were just talking about the commanders winning last night and how exciting that was. Joe's, Joe is the brother-in-law of, of Logan, whose wife uh, and he met at West Point. They were both West Point cadets together, got married. Now they're both on active duty together. And um, she, uh, he came into the church through our CIA. So we've sort of adopted that family. There's really, not that we don't love everybody in our CIA. They're all wonderful, but uh, Logan is really special. And it's, a, it's an amazing family. And Joe is very faithful to come. And he, uh, we see the whole family at Mass every week. So... I'm grateful for him to be here. All right. Um, what I want to remind you of is what we looked at basically uh, last week. Joe, did you get one of these Magnificats last yes. week? Okay, good. Um, remind you that we were looking again at Luke. We're beginning to get almost through Luke chapter one, but we'll probably won't quite finish it tonight. But then I had completely forgotten that next Tuesday was Thanksgiving week, and I was all set to get everybody back on Tuesday, but we will not meet next Tuesday. I found out years ago that on Thanksgiving week, the women start preparing for Thursday on Monday. So people wouldn't come. RCI, I don't mind as much. It's only a handful of them and they're kind of obligated. So I do meet on Monday, but I have not done Bible study on Tuesday during Thanksgiving week for many years. So we will not meet for two weeks. And I put that chart in there for you so you would remember because I didn't this morning. Okay, so last time we looked at Luke's nativity and we talked about the fact that the fullness of the Christmas story com is comprised of the first two chapters of Matthew's gospel and the first two chapters of Luke's gospel. And remember, Matthew was writing for a Jewish audience and he was heavily favoring the idea of the new Moses, the new covenant, uh, his book is written in five parts, like the five parts of the Pentateuch or, or the law. Uh, he was stressing very heavily that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited anointed one, the one that they've been waiting for 500 years, the one that would fulfill the prophecy of Daniel, and on and on and on. Matthew was heavily into that. Now, Luke is writing as a Gentile to the converts, primarily to the church in Asia Minor that Paul founded, because Luke went with Paul on many of his missionary journeys. So as a Gentile, he's writing to Gentiles, although he has a great Jewish background, and he certainly knows the Old Testament very, very well. But he does present things in a little different venue because of his audience. So putting them together, you get the Christmas story. I've often told the classes about when I was in the Anglican church in Geneva, when I was like 10 and 11, or 11 and 12, each, each Christmas I was in the Passion. The passion. And the Christmas pageant, the Christmas pageant was about 30 minutes long and the whole, whole Christmas story unfolded. So one year I was a shepherd and I wore a bathrobe and a towel around my head. And the next year I was a king and I got to wear my mother's Chinese bathrobe and some kind of homemade crown. So I, I've lived those parts, but it all unfolds just in 30 minutes, the whole, the whole thing. And it just seems like that's the story of Christmas. You think of, you think of Nazareth, you think of a cave, or basically, if you're like me, I grew up thinking it was a, a German barn painted red, you know, and there it was a beautiful wooden barn and the animals were inside, you know. I never envisioned it being a cave until I went to the Holy Land and saw it. 
and and you sort of envision it all unfolding rather quickly. And yet there's so much information that we looked at in Matthew, but we'll see in Luke that take us back to the Old Testament and point to the fulfillment of what was prophesied by these great prophets and what the people of Israel were looking for and what the new converse needed to know about Judaism. So that's what we'll be looking at tonight. So we saw that last week. We saw that the authorship was concluded in the early church that it belonged to Luke because the statement, the gospel according to Luke was not written in the original scrolls. Um, and so the church fathers identified Luke as the author. They said he was a physician. He was a Gentile companion of Paul. And we think his gospel was completed in the early 60s because um, to, to this Greek speaking audience, because nothing is ever mentioned about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So it's obvious these gospels had most likely were written in that earlier time, but it had to be after the 50s because the 50s are when Paul was out on his missionary journey. So putting it in context, that's about when he was writing his gospel. Uh, he was structured very similar to Matthew and Mark, but he did not use the five divisions that Matthew used. And he talked about his audience hearing from existing works. So he may have been talking about Matthew and Mark, may have been talking about other writings, but there was the oral tradition. Most of the stories between the time of Jesus' resurrection in 33 and the writing down of the Gospels in 50 were being carried out orally. So these apostles, these early bishops, these people forming these churches were telling these stories, just like in the Old Testament, they were carried out. Moses probably presented them orally, and they were probably presented in their entirety orally until eventually the scrolls were starting to be written down. And the same thing happened with the New Testament. So you see that the audience uh, had been exposed to the stories and he was confirming them. We also talked about the significance of names last week. Zechariah means God who remembers. Zechariah is the husband of Elizabeth. Both are from the royal family of priests. Um, they were both from the line of Aaron, so they could be priests. Uh, and and um, they were barren. Elizabeth was barren. And we saw that as perceived to be a curse, although so many of the great patriarchs came from an initial barren mother who later in her life had children. So barrenness is also been used to demonstrate the power of God to bring something out of the unnatural to fulfill his desire, his divine plan. So, so many of the patriarchs, as I said, came from that kind of environment. So Elizabeth, was, uh, uh, Elizabeth wasn't that unusual, but she was elderly. And we also discussed the sign that Zechariah uh, was selected by Lot when his clan went to Jerusalem. Now he lived in Ancorin, which is about the same distance, maybe a little bit further from Jerusalem towards the west than Bethlehem is towards the south. So it's about five miles. But um, he came from a, today and, and then, a grape growing area. The hills are just covered with vineyards. And when you go there today, you can just see th these grape vineyards all over that area. And it's quite mountainous or hilly. And his house is at the top of a major hill. And there's a church in the little town of Ancorin dedicated to St. Joseph. But Elizabeth and Zechariah lived in this little house where there's a church at the top of this hill. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. We knew that he was selected uh, while his clan was there, whether it was for two weeks or three weeks, by lot to get the second most important um, task to be done in the temple. And every day, a priest came into the temple at first in the first of the day, early morning, a specific time, probably right at sunup, while outside the other priest were offering a lamb in sacrifice. And this priest would go into the holy room and there in the uh, altar of incense, right in front of the veil, hiding the holy of holies, he would burn incense to reflect the prayers of the people who were gathered outside in the courtyard on the other side of the wall where the animal sacrifice is being made. So you have the, the fire and the animal sacrifice and the smoke going up to heaven outside. And then you have the priest inside offering our prayers in terms of incense. 
in front of the, of the thing twice a day, early morning and last thing in the evening. And it's the holiest place a priest could serve other than the high priest. And the only thing he could do beyond that was to go into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and offer uh, a sacrifice, uh, put, they put blood of an animal and originally in Solomon's temple on the Ark of the Covenant. But by this time, there was no Ark. It's taken out of the Babylonian captivity, never returned. So there's nothing in that room. But this was a very, very once in a lifetime experience. So he was there and most likely his prayer every single day of his entire priesthood was, God, give me a son. Because the priesthood and all of basically wealth was passed on from father to the oldest son. And that's why the killing of the oldest son in Egypt, which is such a significant thing, because in many cases, if they didn't have any other sons, that would be the end of the family. So Zechariah could not pass on his priesthood to a son if he didn't have any children. So it was truly an amazing event for the angel Gabriel to come and tell him that he would have a son. And so he meets this guy, Gabriel, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute, but you and I know Gabriel because we know the Christmas story and we know Gabriel because Gabriel talked to Mary. So you think this guy had two roles to play in about three months different. But we find out Gabriel was somewhere else 500 years ago. And if you were a good Jew, you would remember that. You would know who Gabriel was. We've heard of him before. So this priest is there and he's encountering an angel and the angel is going to identify him as Gabriel. It must have blown his mind because he'll know who Gabriel was. So that's where we were. So we want to look at that. So we want to pick up from there and we want to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. And it goes like this. Okay. Just before that, Gabriel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you shall name him John. Well, that was the answer to his prayer. He must have been shocked. But all he knows at this point is this guy is an angel. And so he was afraid because angels were dangerous and they often a lot of people died. So he said, verse 14, and you will, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth, meaning John the Baptist, for he will be great before the Lord and he shall drink no wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now, if you remember the, the, Na, the Nazarite vow, not, not somebody from Nazareth, but the vow of the Nazarite, that was the vow that you could take for a short period of time, like St. Paul does, or for a longer period, maybe a year, or for your life. And one of the things that you could not do was touch anything dead, get near any sickness, or take anything from the vine. You couldn't eat grapes, raisins, grape juice, well, you didn't have grape juice, but wine, or anything from the raisins. So you would swear off of those things for the period of time you took this vow to go into the temple and pray in a special way. Um, as I'll show you in a second, some scholars think that he maybe was an Nazarene all his life. But uh, Luke doesn't tell us that. So, so this is where we are. Come on, guy. All right. Uh, a Nazarite, not a Nazarite. So he could have been a Nazarite, but most likely was not. Fact is that John was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb because we see him leap for joy in the presence of Mary when Elizabeth cries out, how can it be that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, we believe that he received the Holy Spirit at that point in utero. So this is going to be an amazing fact. The church actually celebrates three birthdays. I don't know if you know this. The saints' days are death days, as far as I know. So we're always celebrating the death of St. Francis or the death of St. Dominic. But the three birthdays we celebrate are Jesus, Christmas, Mary, and John the Baptist. And it's because the church believes that these were the three people born without sin. Now, he wasn't immaculately conceived like Mary was. He had a normal conception. But because he received the Holy Spirit in utero, there is this theological belief that he was without sin. And therefore, the church celebrates his birthday. It's just an interesting uh, fact. 
Um, verse 16 and 17 goes on and he says, and he, John the Baptist, in turn, many of the, will turn many of the sons of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, Elijah prophesied, was the first prophet, and he brought about the whole idea of these, this prophecy. And he said, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready, make ready for the Lord a people prepared. He, your son, will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. And Isaiah is going to prophesy that. So you're going to see the prophets foretelling this is going to happen. And here this angel is telling this elderly priest that his elderly wife will bear a son and he will be this person fulfilling all of this prophecy that you, Zechariah, have known all your priestly life. It's truly amazing. Little things that we don't get just by reading through it. So we see that this will come up again when we get to the theophany, which is the identification of the Trinity in Matthew chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus. And there you're going to see Jesus, John the Baptist, baptizing Jesus Christ in the water with a dove coming down as the Holy Spirit and God the Father proclaiming, this is my beloved son in whom uh, I'm well pleased. So it's a, it's a beautiful image that we're being foretold here that will be fulfilled in Matthew chapter three. Now, what Luke is hoping you will hear, and if you're like me, you would never heard it in your entire life if you didn't have somebody teaching it to you, but they would have heard it, which is the prophecy of the prophet Malachi. And Malachi was one of the later prophets. And in chapter three, he says, behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now, what are the Jews waiting for? They're waiting for the Messiah, the anointed. What are they waiting for him to do? To be the king. And what's he going to do? He's going to go to the temple. He'll be anointed. He will be made the king in the holy temple and represent God's returning even though the Ark of the Covenant may or may not come back, the glory cloud, the Shekinah, in the form of this king will come. And that's what is being prophesied here in Malachi years before what's happening now with Zechariah. So behold, I send my messenger, which is John the Baptist, to prepare the way before me, meaning Christ is coming, and the Lord whom you will seek, that's Jesus, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts, but who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? Now, there's an interesting phrase I'll show you in a second. If I say the Lord's day, what do you think of? Sunday, right? Sunday is the Lord's day. We celebrate the Lord's day. But if I say the day of the Lord, it's not Sunday. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. It's the day that God comes to judge his people. And this is what Malachi says about it. Chapter four, behold, the day comes burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all the evil evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, shall rise with healing in its wings and you shall go forth leaping like calves in the stall and you shall tread down the wicked and there will be ashes under your feet and on that day when i act says the lord of hosts so he is prophesying that the day of the lord will be a day of judgment and only the righteous will survive only the remnant only the enoim the poor in spirit only the daughters of zion they will survive and that's what Luke is hoping you'll hear when you're hearing what he's saying in this gospel. So Malachi chapter one, chapter three is very, very important. And he's talking about the return of the glory cloud to the temple, of God to the temple. And he said, Elijah will be sent 
to prepare the way. At this point, Luke hasn't even mentioned Jesus. We haven't had a word. We're almost in the 16th verse of chapter 1. He hasn't even mentioned the fact that this is the story of the birth of Jesus. But we're already preparing. Come on in. Come on. We're already preparing for something since John the Baptist will come like Elijah, causing them to ask, who is this man preparing for? Who is this Jesus who they're preparing for? And there's already, uh, as Father mentioned, a hint of his divinity. So then verse 18 goes on and he says, um, verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, now here's where he gets into trouble. And I bet you never thought of this. When I tell you in a couple of minutes, it really blew my mind when I first heard. You've heard the story. What happens? He doesn't believe. And so what does the angel do? He said, okay, fine. You don't believe me? You can't talk. I mean, we just think, yeah, okay, it's a big deal. Why did he do that? Why did he stop him from talking? And I'll show you that in a second. It's really amazing. So Zechariah said to the angel, not what Mary's going to say. Mary's going to say, how can this be possible? She's, she's asking for clarification. She wasn't doubting. He's saying, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife's advanced in years. This is impossible. This is rationalism, right? There's no way this can happen. She's too old. I'm too old. What are you talking about? <laughs> You're an angel of God. And I'm going to question you like that. That's what he does. So the angel answers him. I'm Gabriel. Oh, that should scare him to death. <laughs> Gabriel's from Daniel. In the book of Daniel, Gabriel is the one that steps up and tells the people when the Babylonian captivity will end. Daniel chapter 9, verse 20. While I was speaking, this Daniel, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of the people of Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, a man, Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at first, came to me swift in swift flight at the timing of the evening sacrifice. That's the opposite of the morning sacrifice. This is the time in the evening when they got together and they prayed one of the five times the Jews prayed per day. If they still had the temple, they would be offering incense. They'd be offering a lamb, but they're not. They're in the Babylonian captivity. At that time, Daniel receives a vision from Gabriel. And Gabriel says, um, he said, Daniel, whom I have seen in my vision, came to me swift in flight. And he said, oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you wisdom and understanding. At the beginning of your supplication, the word went forth, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the word, understand this vision. Seventy weeks of years are decreed concerning your people and the holy city to finish the transgression and put an end to sin and to atone for iniquity and to bring an everlasting righteousness to seal both vision and prophet and to anoint the most holy place. Before you go back to Jerusalem, it's going to be 70 years of 70 weeks of years. That's four, they came out to be wherever the number comes, comes at about 490, 490 to 500 years. This now, at the time of Zechariah, is 490 years from the time of the Babylonian captivity. Can you imagine what Zechariah must have thought? What? Gabriel, are you kidding me? You're talking to me? You're 490 years old? No, I'm an angel. I'm ageless. I mean, just think about it. It's, it's just really mind-blowing. So that's what's going to happen. At this point, we see um, what's going on. By the way, the name Gabriel means mighty one of God. God Almighty. He's just questioned this guy who's now identified himself as Gabriel. How is this possible? I'm an old man. My wife's old. You're asking me? The messenger from God, almighty, who is all knowledge. So Zechariah questions him, how can it happen? And then the angel identifies himself, as I mentioned. Father, ask if we thought that Zechariah remembered Gabriel from Daniel 9.21. Luke's telling us that Gabriel announced 
what would happen to be fulfilled, and now it's being fulfilled. He chastises Zechariah for his disbelief. And he says in a second, you will be unable to speak what? The gospel. Can you imagine, had he not challenged this, that he could have come out of this meeting and gone and prophesied throughout Israel, Judah, the coming of the Messiah. I have just met the angel Gabriel. My son is going to be fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah and Elijah. He is going to proclaim the coming of the, of the Messiah. And he's my son. So the angel said, because you didn't believe, you're not going to be able to do that. And he doesn't until the baby's born. And the next time we meet, two weeks from tonight, we'll look at Zechariah's proclamation, which happens to be read in the Liturgy of the Hours every single day of the church. It's amazing. But his proclamation of joy about the birth of his son, but he has denied the opportunity to do what he should have been able to do as the end of the priesthood, the, the Levitical priesthood is going to end shortly after in 70 AD. He would have been the last prophetic voice of the priesthood proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. But because he doubted, he was made mute. Not deaf, but he could not speak. So he could not proclaim the evangelium, the good news. And so Zechariah was originally go forth at the temple, announce the good news of salvation, but now he cannot do it. But soon his son, John, will be able to do it. And that's why he is the one crying in the wilderness, announcing the coming of the Messiah. By the way, the Messiah was supposed to come from the east to the west. Everything was facing toward the east. Sun was rose in the morning. Temple was facing the east. God was in the east. The Ark of the Covenant was taken out of the temple to the west. It went to Mount Nebo to the west. And now they were waiting for everything to return from the east. So you have this image of them that's why the Essenes moved themselves down to the desert in the east by the Dead Sea, which is east of Jerusalem. All this geogra geography is important. So Zechariah now comes out of the temple, makes a motion with his hand, and sadly, he then returns home uh, without being able to, to tell anybody what's going on. So he said, um, I'm Gabriel, and he said, and I sent to speak to you and bring you the good news. And then he said, um, and verse 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple and he made signs to them and remained dumb. And when he, his time of service, when his clan was finished, he went home. That's a sad commentary, but that's basically what's happened. Um, his son John's going to prepare the way. And again, as a priest, he had this role, but now John will be the climax of the Levitical priesthood. It was Aaron's job to take care and prepare for the, the tabernacle. So John is going to prepare for the coming of Christ, the word made flesh that's going to dwell in the tabernacle. So that's what John the Baptist was going to do. 24 to 30. So after these days, his wife, Elizabeth, did I miss, did I? No. Okay. 24 to 30. After these days, his wife, Elizabeth conceived and for five months, she hid herself saying, thus the Lord has done to me in these days when he looked upon me to take away the reproach among men. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. We know this from Matthew. So now John is sort of kept catching up to what we had seen with Joseph going from Nazareth down to Bethlehem and having the baby born in the cave. And Gabriel goes to her and says, hail full of grace. The Lord is with you. Well, we know what that means. That's the, 
that's the Hail Mary. The Hail Mary. Come back to that. Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by this saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might mean. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid. The angel always tells you that because you would be afraid. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So now we want to stop and look at some interesting stuff. This point in the story was six months later, and we see this word hail. What does hail mean in English? You hail a cab? You sometimes call to people? But there's no real English word for hail. There's no old English word for hail. Hail doesn't mean what we say in the hail. Hail Mary, full of grace. That just, what, what does that mean? Well, he wasn't writing for the Hail Mary in the 22nd, 21st century. He's writing for the first century audience. And in Greek, the word chari, chari, C-H-A-I-R-E, how would you say it? Chari? Mm -hmm. the, the word chari means rejoice. It was a greeting. If I saw Doug, he was coming in to mass and I was going out of mass, I would say, rejoice, Doug, and Joyce would say, rejoice, Bob. That's the way they greeted one another. It's a greeting of joy. The angel's telling Mary, rejoice, Mary, because what? You're full of grace. That's what he's saying. But we say, hail Mary, full of grace. And we say it like a thousand times, real fast, with very little thought. But that's what was saying. The angel is saying to her, rejoice, Mary, for you're full of grace. And we'll talk about full of grace next week. Now, it was this greeting. And he was announcing something to Mary. And Luke is hoping that you'll hear from that about the prophet Zephaniah. And we'll look at that. He's a contemporary of Isaiah and Micah. And he's proclaiming the pre-exilic coming of the destruction of Jerusalem. And the remnant that's going to stay after the Babylonians carry them off. And Mary and Joseph and the Holy Family are going to be identified as part of that remnant. I wrote a paper on the remnant once at grad school. Went back and reread it. I was amazed that I wrote it. But it was it's a truly amazing thing that God always did. Whenever he decided to destroy uh, the people of Israel, he always left a remnant. As a matter of fact, the Essenes believed this destruction was coming, and they voluntarily left Jerusalem and moved down to the Dead Sea and established and uh, 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 um, can't even think of the name of it now, Hunan, where they built this colony, and they proclaimed themselves to be the remnant. And they would be able to survive when this destruction comes, which they foretold, which ultimately was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And they thought they could make themselves available by being very holy to be the remnant. So this idea of the remnant is coming. So we want to look back at Zephaniah for a couple of minutes. All right. Zephaniah was a prophet who prophesied between 640 and 626. That's before Christ. So that's 600 years ago. He prophesied to, to three kings. Now look, here is the north right here. Can you, does this thing work? You see that? It's hard to see it. It's hard, but okay. But on the, on the left-hand side of this chart, you see Jeroboam down to... Um, Hosea, and the fall of Samaria. So Samaria fell in 721. No longer exist. Ten tribes are all assimilated by the Syrians. But Judah is still going on. And you're going to have Manasseh and Amon, who are, Manasseh is a relatively bad Jewish king. Amon was awful. And then we had Josiah, who is a young king and does a very good job of returning everything to God, making everything beautiful. But this prophet is talking to those three kings who are three of the last six until Everything ends in about 587. So that's who he is. He prophesied during the reign of J Josiah. He preached before the ministries of 
the danger of alien manners that you've adapted from the Greeks, worship of false gods. He was rebuking the court officials. And uh, we don't know a whole lot about it just from his book, but he was a very strong prophet proclaiming what was coming to Jerusalem. Historically, Judah had been robbed of part of its ter ter territory after the Assyrians overran the north. They did come south and they got to the, the, the outskirts of Jerusalem and the king thought they were going to overrun it. And then the angel of God came and in one night struck the army with disease and pestilence. And they were so devastated that they packed up and went home. But they had captured part of the land. So he'd already experienced this coming of the Assyrians. So he's experienced living partly under Assyrian rule during the wicked reign of Manasseh and Amon. And then we're going to see the weakening of the Assyrians by the angel. And there's hopes of maybe a national recovery. He's also active in preaching against the city of Jerusalem. And he pointed towards this period of hopeful religious reform that was carried out by Josiah. And then he preached against the biggest sin of all, which is a constant sin, caused all the problems for both the North and the South, and that's idolatry, worshiping false gods. The first commandment right out of the gate is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no gods before me. Hasn't changed for all the things that are going on in this country today, and all the false gods that are out there with power and politics and money and all the rest of this stuff. There's a lot of people worshiping a lot of false gods, and that hasn't changed. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. So he preached against this idolatry. He laid the, he talked about laying the axe to the root of the religious and moral corruption, which I'll show you in a second. And he did predict the day of the Lord, which I told about you before. The day of the Lord is the day of judgment. These people kept praying, we want the Messiah to come back. We want the Messiah to come back. We want the Messiah. What did Malachi say? You're not ready. If the Messiah comes back today, you'll be burned up. You're sinful people. You are not prepared for him to come. Don't ask for this right now. You need to prepare. And that's what the message of Malachi was. The day of the Lord is coming, but it's not going to be pleasant. His thoughts included prophetic exhortations, threats against judgment, exhortations on penance, and finally the promise of the messianic savior. So all of this is what Luke is hoping you'll hear in this story of the angel talking to the Blessed Mother, because he's referring to this in a subtle way. Now, look at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, and he said, woe to her that is rebellious and defiled. That's Jerusalem. Woe to you, Jerusalem, that's rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city, she listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near her God. This is the condemnation of where Jerusalem was. He say, you're no longer the wife of Yahweh. You've turned into a harlot, Jerusalem. God sees you as a harlot, not his beloved wife. And Jerusalem was originally the beloved wife of God on Mount Zion. Then in chapter 80, verse 80 goes on. He said, therefore, wait for me, says the Lord. For the day when I arise as a witness for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon you my indignation and all the heat of my anger for the fire of my jealous wrath, all the earth shall be consumed if you guys don't turn it around. This is what scares me about being in America right now. You know, God doesn't change. He's immutable. Now, granted, we're not a nation and we don't have a king and a king's not, you know, ruling for us. And we're following. We're all individuals and we all have our own faith and we all have our own relationship with Jesus Christ. And he came to change all of this and we have it. But God himself, you know, I just wonder how long can it go? And I, I asked Father, I asked Dr. O'Donnell, I don't know if you know, Dr. O'Donnell's the president of Christendom College and we had the privilege of, our son went there and our grandson went there. But we went to Rome with, Christian, he went uh, every spring, he would take a pilgrimage with students to Rome for two weeks. And we went as, we were in graduate school at the time, so we went as students, but we went as adult supervisors. And we had this wonderful trip. And just before we went, he was giving class on history. And I raised my hand and I said, what is keeping God from destroying the United States the way he did Israel? And he said, and I think it's very prophetic, 
No one in this room knows how many good and faithful people get on their knees every night and pray for God's mercy. He said, that's what's staying in the hand of God. Us asking for mercy. But I don't know how long it can last. And I don't know how much bad, how much worse it could get. But that's that's verse eight. So he said, he's talking about the coming destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. He said, this is going to happen because it's such a wicked city. Now, in the middle of this story of Zephaniah, Father suggested we go back and look at Jeremiah chapter 40. Is another prophet. Jeremiah chapter 40 talks about, again, the same thing happening. Here, uh, it's verse 1, chapter 40, the word that came to Jeremiah, he was a prophet, from the Lord after Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard of Babylon, had let him go from Ramoth, which is the place they assembled the people to carry them off to the Babylonian captivity. When he took him bound in chains, along with all his captives of Jerusalem, and Judah were being exiled to Babylon. And the captain of the guard said to Jeremiah and said to him, the Lord your God pronounced this evil against this place, which is the Babylonian captivity. The Lord has brought it about and has done it, he said, because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey his voice. And this thing has come upon you. And now behold, I, the king of the guard, are going to release you, um, Jeremiah, the prophet, but the rest of the people are going to go off in the Babylonian captivity. But I release you today from the chains on your hands. And it seems to me you can come with us to Babylon if you want, but you don't have to. But this is the message that Zechariah is, uh, Jeremiah is pronouncing that he got from this guy as to why the Babylonian captivity was occurring. But the most important one is Ezekiel. And, and I, I, I remember we talked about this a long, long time ago. But I want you to listen to what was going on at the time of Ezekiel. So this is in the sixth year. This is during the Babylonian captivity. He was there in Babylon. So in the sixth year of their captivity, in the sixth month, the fifth day of the month, I sat in my house in Babylon with the elders of Judah, those who had been brought in captivity. And they were sitting before me. And the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me and beheld, and I beheld, and lo, a form that had appeared of a man uh, below what appeared to be his loins, it was fire, and above his loins, it was like the appearance of brightness of bronze. And he put forth a form on his hand, and he took me by the lock of my head. And the spirit lifted me up between heaven and earth and brought me to in vision, brought me in vision of God to Jerusalem. So he is being in a vision, picked up by the Holy Spirit, carried from Babylon to Jerusalem, which is still existing the way we're going to see what he sees in his vision because the third captivity hadn't occurred these people were still living in jerusalem they were still serving in the temple and this is what um ezekiel is going to see that's going on in jerusalem that it was so bad that it led to all this stuff that we're talking about now listen to what he says he said he in the vision of jerusalem to the entrance of the gateway of the inner court, that's the temple, facing north, where the seat, where uh, where was the seat of the image of de jealousy, which provoked a jealousy. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, like the vision I saw in the in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now in the direction of the north. So I lifted up my eyes to the north, and behold, the north, the, al the altar gate, and the entrance was an image of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they're doing? the great abominations that the house of Israel are committing here to drive me from my sanctuary. But you'll see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. This is the court leading into the temple. And when I looked, behold, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, son of man, dig in the wall. When I dug in the wall, and lo, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the vile abominations that are committed here. So I went in and I saw, and there portrayed upon the wall around about were all kinds of creeping things and loathsome beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel. And before them stood 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. And they were standing among them and each had a censer in his hand and the smoke of the cloud of incense went up. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing in the dark? Every man in his room, pictures, for they, the Lord does not see and the Lord has forsaken the land. 
And he said to me, you will see even greater abominations. And he brought me to the entrance of the North Gate. And behold, there sat women weeping. And he said, have you seen this, O son of man? You'll see even greater abominations. And he brought me to the inner court, the house of the Lord, door of the temple. There were 25 men with their backs to the temple. And they were faces worshiping the sun. It's an Egyptian worship. Towards the east. Have you seen this, son of man? Is the sight of the house of Judah committing abominations which committed here? And there, and the land shall be filled with violence. Provoke me to further anger. Lo, he put a branch to their nose, and therefore you will deal with his wrath. But then he said in chapter 9 that he would select an individual to go through the city and identify the people who were abhorred at this evil that he's just described. So there was a group, a remnant, a small group. And this man was, this go, this angel was to go through the city, identify every one of them and put the mark on their forehead. The mark on their forehead. It's baptism. And the remnant would stay behind and the rest would be either killed or carried off in the Babylonian captivity. This was the image of Ezekiel. And this is what we're hearing Luke relate back to as it's being unfolded. So the righteous were left behind. And it's funny if you've ever read or I hope you haven't. If you've ever heard, I'm sure you've heard of it. The Left Behind series by LaHaye. Everybody was there. It was a big thing in the 90s. Everybody was reading the Left Behind series. But let me tell you, it was, a, it was so bad. This actually happened. So many people were reading it. And the image is that the righteous people would be raptured. By the way, rapture is not in the Bible. The idea was raptured is that they would be taken up into heaven and then everybody that was bad would be left behind. So suddenly people would just disappear. And if you would come home from school, you would have to worry every single day whether your mother was there or not. Kids in school were worried their mother would be raptured and they were terrified. And the priest had to get the whole congregation together at St. Bernadette's and talk on this and say, this is nonsense, children. Don't worry, your mother's going to be at home. But they were terrified that their mother who read this book was talking out loud oh, and this wonderful, you could be raptured and, and that suddenly they would be gone. Well, the Bible is just the opposite. It's the people who are left behind that are good. The bad people are taken off the captive. It's just crazy. Oh, they believe this stuff. It's just, it's out there. It's crazy. So anyway, that's why it's just the opposite of, of what he was saying. So then a father pointed out that in salvation history, you want to be, you want to be left behind. You want to dwell in the land. You want to be the remnant. And that's what Zephaniah is talking about. And that's what the restoration is all about. And then finally in 14, he talks about the daughter of Zion. Father said, there's another place you can hear it, that he's upset with the translators because he's using that same word, Greek word incorrectly. It's not hail. It would appear that to understand you, you needed to what, how it was used in the Septuagint. And he said in the Septuagint, it should have said, Rejoice, O daughter of Zion. That's Mary. Shout, O Israel. The Lord has taken away the judgment against you, which we heard in Malachi and the others. The King of Israel, Yahweh, is within you. Within you. In you. This means the King of Israel is now living in our midst. That's the whole message of Jesus Christ. That's the whole message of the incarnation. That's the whole fulfillment that we're going to spend the rest of this year looking at in the Synoptic Gospels. The Old Testament, Israel only had one king. He was, he was anointed, but he was human. And now they've been asking for a divine king. Christ is going to be fully human and king, fully divine and king. So this means the incarnation, the divine king has become human and divine at the same time. So when we look at the rest of Zephaniah, you see this call for the casting out of the wicked, the gathering and saving the lame. And then you see a lot of marital language. And finally, you get this image of God coming to his people, the incarnation, the tabernacle where God will dwell among his people. Whole purpose of his bride, the bride is to give him a son. Mary is going to be the bride to bring about the divine son. So again, Father suggesting that Luke is hoping that we're going to hear all of this as an echo in Zephaniah. So the last part going back, to Luke, we'll see verse 24. I said, I've already read that, uh, where she conceived and uh, 
we see this word, hail, rejoice full of grace. Uh, again, the word means something that makes you happy. Rejoice. Rejoice, you have been given the thing that causes rejoicing. Then 24 to 30, we said, two ways Luke's used this word in reference to the Magnificat. Hail, but it means rejoice. Full of grace, the Lord is with you. In Greek, it's that same root. And it's interesting. Rejoice, you've been given the thing that causes rejoicing. Finally, in 31 through 33, he said, And behold, you will conceive and your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Joshua. Jesus is that bad translation from Greek. Joshua was his name, but we, we say Jesus, that's fine. Now, what does that fulfill? Second Samuel 7, the promise that the Davidic king will sit on the throne of David forever. It's also a reference to Daniel 7, which talked about this king. It's about the prophecy that stated the line of David will always rule over the people. But Luke's going to go on and tell us more about the child, and he's only hinted at it at this point. Verse 34, he says, and Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no husband? She wasn't saying, how can this be? Because I'm too young or this is impossible or who are you to tell us? She's asking for clarification. So here's what the scholars think about this clarification. Vestin and Gregory of Nyssa said she was referring to her vow of virginity. We believe that she may have been a temple virgin. And when a temple virgin was given by her family to the temple, they lived in the temple with a group of women who took care of these young girls until the age of menstruation. And then they had to leave the temple. So what happened to them? We talked about that last time. Maybe, maybe, I'm not saying it's true. Maybe Joseph was an older man, had children by his first wife, was a widower, and he agreed to take her in as a virgin and, and treat her as a temple virgin. Um, the other story is that Joseph was a young man and he took a vow of virginity himself and they lived together, but not in the marital act. Um, father said that, if she was a temple virgin, a lot of this makes a lot of sense. So she was not asking, how could she conceive? She was saying, how could, even though I'm betrothed, he's going to take care of me. I'm a temple virgin. So how, how can I have a son? How, how can that possible? And her question is, how can this be that I know man is in the present tense? I don't know man right now. So then father goes on and explains some scholars see that because she wasn't married, but he he asked this interesting question. He said, can you imagine a, a young woman a few days before her wedding proclaiming that she was blessed by God and someday will have a boy and he'll grow up to be the president of the United States? And then say, but how is this possible? Of course it's possible. Of course that's possible because you're going to get married. You're going to have this. So it wasn't impossible. But since she was in that unique position as a temple virgin, that's what her question was. The language is pointing at something else beyond the fact that she was not married. It's the veil of virginity. There is no way this can't happen because of my promise of virginity. And the angel responds to her, don't sweat it, Mary. We've got this covered. Mm -hmm. And he's going to explain it. So 35 through 45 is where you get the rest of the story. Um, we find in that part, in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, we see the word skeka, which means to rest, seka, to mean rest. And from that comes the word shekinah. And shekinah is a reference to the glory cloud. And the glory cloud is seen as something where God rested. He came into the temple and rested among his people. Mary will be overshadowed by the glory cloud. The glory cloud will rest upon her. It's used to describe that. So Luke's use of the verb here is right of Exodus 40, verse 35, which was the resting of the glory cloud on the tent of the meeting with the Ark of the Covenant. In this case, we're going to see Mary as the new Ark. Luke will clarify this by pointing out uh, that like the Ark, she'll spend three months in Judah, in the hill country, just like the Ark of the Covenant spent three months in Judah in preparation for David to take it to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6. Luke's telling us the baby in Mary's womb was not just in the line of David, 
but he's also the Davidic king. He's the word of God, not on stone, but in the flesh. That fulfills Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold Israel, I'll make a new covenant with you. Not like the old covenant, which was made with our fathers of Mount Horeb, but this one will be written in the flesh. Major theme of Luke's gospel. This is the new covenant. The ark is no longer to be made out of a cave of wood, but the flesh of a woman. Mary is the new ark. The word of God came down like stone tablets. Now it's be the flesh of man who will speak the word in person. And now we will become a living stones in the, of the living God. So Mary enters Zechariah's house, and we're going to see the parallel between what Mary is going to proclaim in her Magnificat with what Hannah proclaimed in 2 Samuel 7 about her son. And we'll do that next time when we look at the Magnificat of Hannah and compare it to the Magnificat of Mary. And Elizabeth is going to shout, and the baby leapt in her womb, should remind him of David dancing before the ark as he brought them into the temple. So that's as far as we got this morning. And I want to remind you we won't meet next week. Beverly and I want to wish each of you a very happy and blessed Thanksgiving. And we will see you two weeks from tonight where we will continue this magnificent story. So God bless you all. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Raymond, glory St. Raymond of Pentafort, wise and holy patron, come to the aid of those entrusted to your care. To all who flee to your protection, intercede for us in our need. Help us through your prayers, example, and teachings. Proclaim the truth of the gospel, all we meet. When you've reached the fullness of our years, we beseech you to guide us home, to live in peace with you, our Mother Mary, and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all, and you at home, and have a happy Thanksgiving. And thank you for coming out in this terrible weather. I'm so surprised and pleased. Honest, I didn't think anybody would show up tonight. Honest, God bless you. Thank you, Bob. God bless. God bless. Thank you.